chapter 11 will definitely make your head spin. This is all about rotational motion. Now, rotational motion is slightly more in-depth than just circular motion. Now, we talked about circular motion like earlier in chapter 4 when we talked about planar motion, right? Or motion in a plane, an XY plane. Rotational motion is different because we're going to actually talk about not only just the behavior of turning in circular motion, we're going to talk about things rotating, whether it's at fixed point or rotating at, at, while it's moving translationally, as well as um, rotation of different objects with different shapes. So it's going to be instead of just a particle moving in a circular motion, it will be an actual, like a solid disk moving in a certain you know, rotations, um, or a hoop, or a rod turning at a certain fixed point, all right? So it will be a slightly uh, challenging chapter here because we're going to basically run out of English alphabet for variables. So we, we're going to have to use a lot of Greek symbols, like Greek alphabets. And this is where the term, like, oh, it's all Greek to me, you know? Yeah, this is, it's going to be all Greek to you very soon. All right. All right. So relationship between linear speed and angular speed. <clears throat> well, we have to understand a few terminologies that we're going to have to use. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to have to basically understand a um, few terminologies that's going to actually, um, some are going to be the same, some are going to be different, okay? For example, um, when we use time, time is going to be the same for rotational versus linear, okay? And when we talk about time, it is basically change in time, right? Delta T, where initial time is equal to zero, and then whatever the final time is, the change in time, right? That's pretty easy. Instead of um, delta X or delta Y, we will be using delta S, which is actually the arc length, okay? So this delta S from here to here, the red delta S versus this blue delta S, right? And even though they sweep out exact same amount of theta, the length that it travels is definitely going to be different. And that delta S in red is definitely going to be greater than delta S in blue. Okay? As this thing travels across this, as it sweeps out this much delta theta, or the actual angle of a sweep, that will be the same for both S and blue delta S versus red delta S. Okay? So maybe I should use different colors. I use the same in green. So maybe time should be in green instead of red. And delta S will also be same for both of these two objects. So if I have an object here traveling from here to here versus an object from here to here, right? Delta S that it sweeps out has to be the same. And the time that it takes to sweep out this much is also the same for both blue object and the red object. Okay. Now, if we think about how fast this thing turns, right, how fast this thing turns, 
that's the rate of okay so I'm going to say rate of turn so here I'm going to say initial time let's say let's say this is t initial and this is t final so it takes from here where we're going to say initial time is zero and whatever this t final is that's the time that we're going to get right so the time that it takes to sweep out this much which is at delta theta right so this delta theta the amount of sweep divide that by the time that it takes to sweep out that much of an angular i'm going to say angular displacement right is known as omega this is not w this is lowercase omega which is a greek letter that's the last letter of the greek alphabet okay um all right this omega is going to be same whether it is for the blue object or the red object why the amount of sweep which we call this delta theta is going to be exactly the same value in the same amount of time okay so omega will also be the same for both objects and omega is a rate of how much turn per unit of time in seconds so you would have you would have unit of radians per second as our units okay now remember radians is a fictitious unit right it really doesn't have a unit right we just call it a unit because it's a special ratio of arc length divided by the radius right so sometimes this omega can be represented as just per second as well all right so be careful with that so how are these going to be different for Or there is going to be different for the actual linear angular momentum versus linear momentum. Well, here, this thing will have linear velocity that's going to be tangential to the circular path. That linear velocity is actually v tangential okay this v tangential happens tangential path to this circular right and this will be different for different location of where this radius is okay so the difference between these two tangential velocities are going to be further you are out from the center, greater the linear velocity is or linear speed. And I guess we forgot to like mention the most obvious one which is R. So if we had red R, red R, red R is definitely bigger than blue R. I mean, that's so obvious that we didn't even put that in there, but we should, I guess, right? The red R is definitely bigger than the blue R. So that's very obvious. Okay. So I don't know how many of you are in a, like a marching band, you know, but like if you actually have to like, like you know line up right and then here's the piccolo player right? and here's like the sousaphone player and the tuba player right and, and they're all lined up with all these different instruments 
and you have to make a turn like this, right, as you're playing. You know, the piccolo player's like, oh, come on, guys, follow me, you know? It, it just, like, turned, like, really easy. But but the sousaphone, you know, player's going to be like, wait up, guys, wait up. He's, like, running across the field just to catch up with the rest of the line, right? Because you have to travel this much distance in the same amount of time that it turns for this person to go here and this person to go here and this person to go here, right? So further you are out, you better run much faster in order to keep up with that turn. Okay, so if you think of that visual anchor, I think it would help for the rest of this chapter. Okay, now make sure you understand the direction of rotation. If we are turning in this direction, we call that counterclockwise, right? So this for those of you who don't know how to read like analog clock, you know, it starts at 12 o'clock here, and then it turns this way, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, like that, OK? Because we're living in a digital world, so sometimes you don't know how to read. So this is going in the opposite direction of the clock's motion. So this is counter, right, clockwise. Or otherwise, CCW is how they would actually represent counterclockwise. Clockwise is just CW. OK? So make sure you know all these ingredients that follows with this rotational versus linear, right? So. Linear speed of this point particle P is tangent speed along the arc length. All right? So the linear speed is the distance traveled divided by time. Well, the distance is measured in arc length. So arc length divided by delta T is equal to V. So this is linear speed. Okay. And even though I guess linear speed, you could say it's like a straight line, but it's really not straight, is it? Because it is going in the arc, like sort of quasi-circular path, right? So when I say straight line, I'm going to put the straight in quotes, okay? So it's, but it's sort of arced, right, distance. Angular speed, right, is basically going to be um, the rate of how much radiance it sweeps out in given unit of time. Okay, so the angular speed is um, you could think of delta theta as angular displacement. Okay, you could think of it as angular. displacement, okay, and you could think of theta as like angular position, right? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, fine. Angular position, right? Now, angular position versus angular displacement is very, very similar to, you know, just linear position, like x initial or x final or any x position, versus displacement. Linear displacement is x final minus x initial. Well, angular displacement is the same thing. Final angular position minus the initial angular position, right? So that would actually be appropriate. Right? Now, this delta S, obviously, is right, arc length, right? So distance along the 
parking, right? Okay. Here, so when we actually think about the angular displacement divided by delta t, we call this omega. Okay. This is known as omega. Omega is a lowercase omega can be described as spinning spinning speed okay. if you are spinning from your point of view right in the counterclockwise direction, right? So if you're spinning counterclockwise, you could consider that to be your positive direction. If it's spinning clockwise, you could consider that to be your negative direction. And I'm going to show you why and, and, and it's kind of hard to talk about this without showing you the, the reasoning, right? Now, if I were to spin something, okay, um, I thought I would show you this here. All right, let me see if I can. We'll let, them, we'll let them see it. All right. So if you were to, well, well, I'm upside down. Mr. Kim, you're in Australia. Well, not really. All right. So, so if you were to um, watch me spin this wheel, all right. For me, it's turning clockwise. But for you, when you're watching this from the other side on the screen, this thing is spinning counterclockwise. Yes? Who's right? Come on, Sarah, who's right? <laughs> you're not set. Wait. I'm sorry. Paige. <laughs> oh, sorry. Paige. Got your mask up, sorry. Paige, right? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Paige. Who's right? I'm saying it's spinning clockwise. You're saying it's spinning counterclockwise. Who's right? Oh. No. I'm right. I'm always right. <laughs> Mr. Kim is always right. Uh -huh. right? So it's, there's, it's really confusing, isn't it? Right? So for me, if I use my right hand and rotate my hands along the spin, notice my thumb is pointing that way. Right? Now, Paige, you take your right hand out and then rot curl your fingers. Ah, aren't we pointing in the same direction? So that way is positive. So now we can never go, you know, wrong about which way is positive direction. So it will work both ways, whether you're looking at it from that side or from my side. When I see this thing turning, that is the positive direction. Okay, Omega direction. This is omega direction. So you have to use your right-hand rule to figure out the direction of omega, even though it is spinning clockwise for me and counterclockwise for you, but still you can say omega direction for that one. Is that okay, everybody at home? Okay. Yeah? I'm looking at Sarah on the screen. That's why. Yeah. Okay. 
Right? Sophia is up here. She's like wondering, like, why is she, why is she calling me sex? Just, I was trying to cover myself up, but it still didn't work. All right. Anyway, at, at home, I, did you see the demonstration at home? Is it, was that okay? Did you guys see it okay? Yeah. 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 All right. So hopefully, that explains this part of positives and negatives. Right, clockwise and counterclockwise can be confusing depending on how you're looking at it and where you're looking at it from and who's looking at it. But this would actually uh, eliminate all that confusion. All right. All right. So, okay. All right. That looks, looks, that looks good. That looks good. Now let's take a look at page two. All right. The definition of angle and radiance allows us to derive the relationship between linear and angular speed. Okay. So we all know theta is arc length divided by radius. So that's right. We, we already established that. So delta theta is delta s over r. That makes sense too, right? So here, your arc length is measured in meters, right? And your R is measured in meters, right? So theta should not have any units at all, okay? So this definition This unit is given to you as radiance for some reason. Okay? So if you were to think about this as non-calculus way of showing things in a calculus way, right? This delta becomes D, right? In calculus way, the instantaneous, so d theta is equal to ds over r, right? So what is ds? ds is then is equal to r d theta. ds is equal to r d theta. This will be more calculus way. Okay? So, if you do ds over dt, then you get your instantaneous velocity, okay? So, if you were to look at, right, divide both sides by uh, dt, right? So, here, this is non-calculus, of course, this down here. And if I divide both sides by dt, okay? So here, let's say equation one. And this is equation one times one over dt delta t to both sides, right? Then this becomes Omega. This is linear distance divided by delta t. Right? So the linear distance divided by delta t is v. So this linear distance divided by delta t is tangential speed, right? Or tangential velocity. So if we multiply both side by r, this side r can canceled out, and this v tan is equal to then omega r. All right. So this. is 
very, very, very important. Okay. So, if we were to have a small omega, okay, if omega is small, right, that means it is spinning slowly. If omega is big, right? then it is spinning fast. Okay. So that's what omega is. So again, radiance itself is a fictitious unit that represents a special ratio of arc length divided by radius. So this can actually appear or disappear from the unit. So sometimes it could be represented as radiance per second or just sometimes per second. Okay, so be careful with that. All right. Well, what if this thing is not spinning at a constant rate? What if it starts somewhere and then starts to go faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and, faster and picks up speed of rotation? Then there must be change in omega. Right? There has to be change in omega. Well, what happens when there's a change in omega? Then we have angular acceleration. Now, angular acceleration has unit of radians per second squared. And it is represented with that little fishy thing, right? The little fishy thing is called alpha. Alpha is the first Greek letter in an al Greek alphabet. Right? This is a lowercase alpha. Okay. So alpha is equal to change in omega over change in time. And since we know omega is measured in radians per second, if you divide that by seconds, so you're going to have radians per second squared. Okay, so this is the unit for alpha. So how is that related with linear acceleration? Well, we know V is equal to omega R. We just derived that. And since acceleration tangentially is equal to delta V over delta T, right, we substitute this omega r into my v, then we have delta omega r over delta t. You know r has to be constant, right? You know r has to be constant. So this turns into r delta omega over delta t. Well, what is this omega delta omega over delta t? We said it was alpha. So that is equal to R times alpha. Right? So this here is alpha. So our tangential acceleration can now be defined as alpha R. Remember. If there is change in speed, there's also change in velocity, tangential velocity. 
right? And if there's object going in a circular motion, there always has to be radial acceleration as well, right? Therefore, therefore, we have two accelerations happening when things are speeding up as it spins. We have linear acceleration as well as radial acceleration. So we have to have two accelerations. So this tangential acceleration is alpha r. And radial acceleration, we know it as v squared over r, right? So here, alpha r is in tangential direction. So you could think of this as tangential unit vector. And radial unit vector is going to be along the radius. If we were to substitute the V with omega R into my radial, this becomes omega square R square over R, where one of the R's will cancel out from top and bottom, giving you, right, giving you omega squared r. That's how we get this a total. This a total is alpha r tangential hat plus omega squared r radial hat. Okay, so if we had something traveling in a circular path like this, and it sweeps out a certain angle theta, right? So let's say it sweeps out this angle theta, right? So theta initial is zero, and theta final is theta, so delta theta is theta, okay? So we will have from here, as it travels here, at this point, exact location, right? If we were to travel in a counterclockwise direction, this, at this location, we will have radial acceleration flowing in towards the center. So here's our radial. So this is A radial. And we have a tangential going this way. So we, if we were to think about combining these two and add them up, our a total has to be the hypotenuse or the resultant of these two acceleration added together. So A total would be this. All right, so if you, if you were to put this in a separate drawing here, so let's say like two centimeters. So if we say that is A tangential, and then A radial is, I would say, a centimeter. So this is A radial. And then this will be A total. Remember. They are always perpendicular to one another, A tangential and A radial, right? So if you ever want to figure out the magnitude of A total, your A total will have magnitude of square root of, right? Alpha R squared plus, right? Um, omega squared R quantity squared. 
Now, you don't have to use, obviously, omega r, omega square r. You could still, you, you could still use v square over r if you know the v. So that's really no problem. Okay. So this would be the magnitude of a total. Okay. Again, we will use that convention of right-hand rule. And when acceleration is in positive direction, when it's speeding up in the counterclockwise direction, okay, and omega is also in the positive direction when it's turning in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the convention we will use, okay? This is the convention we will use on Earth, all right? So this, this could only happen, this could only be like recognized or understood by beings with bilateral symmetry that has left and right side, right? If you have a spherical beings in the distant parts of the universe, it may not quite work with right-hand rule because they don't have right and left. All right. All right, that was page three. So, how can we actually think about constant angular acceleration? So let's say we have something that is spinning with a constant angular acceleration. That means it's spinning faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster right? So the constant angular acceleration only happens, right? When things are going, well, it could also slow down at a constant rate as well. Then you have negative alpha, right? So if you were to apply a brake on a disc and then it's going to slow things down, then you could also have neg negative constant angular acceleration. So if we were to take a look at, right, delta S is equal to theta R. V is equal to omega R, A is equal to alpha R, and if you were to look at the equation number one, first equation, right? First equation states VF is equal to VI plus AT. Now, this is from your summer assignment. If we substitute omega R as my V, so VF is omega F R, my VI is omega I R, and my A is alpha R times T. Look what happens to all my R's. I could cancel out all my R's. And this obviously is a vector, right? So we actually have to have directions for this. So, so positive x means forward, right? right? Or negative velocity means right backwards, right? And in this case. When we have omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha t, positive omega means counterclockwise, right? Or negative omega means clockwise. This also goes with alpha as well. So you could think of this as also as vectors, because they are actually. They're in a completely di different dimension as the plane of the rotation. Matter of fact, these vectors are perpendicular to the plane of the rotation. Okay. All right. Now, I know some people would think this theta can be measured in degrees or in radians. 
But when we're working with these equations, there's no negotiation whatsoever. You must use radians, not degrees, okay? So, That's very, very, very important. Okay. Therefore, theta will be in radians. Omega will be in radians per second. Alpha should be measured in radians per second squared. Okay. If you are using these constant acceleration equations, you can use revolutions per second as long as you're consistent with the, all the equations. Okay? if and only if consistent throughout the equation, okay? So if you are using revolutions per second, make sure this is in revolutions, this is in revolutions, this is in revolutions per second, and revolutions per second squared. Same thing with this. Revolutions, revolutions per second, revolutions per second, revolutions per second squared. As long as you are consistent with it, that's fine. But you cannot use degrees. That simple. So if you were to think about the linear position as your position final in the, along the arc path, you know, circular path in the arc length, and this is your initial position in that circular or semicircular arc length, plus VIT plus 1F AT squared, right? So if you think of it, this as like X final is equal to X initial plus VIT plus 1F AT squared, we bend it slightly, right? Still, it's going to be, you could consider that as a linear motion. So if we substitute S with, right, theta R, so S final is theta final R, S initial is theta initial R, omega R, so for V, right, so V initial is omega initial R. A as alpha R. So again, look what happens to all my R's. They all cancel out, giving me my equation number two. Right? So this is equation number two. So if you remember your equations for these, these are exact same things, but it's all Greek. I guess except for time. And my third equation, my third equation, this is what you use when you don't have time. Right? If you don't have time, you use this. Right? 
vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta x, or delta s in our case. Substitute the vf with omega f r. Substitute vi with omega initial r, a with alpha r, delta s with delta theta r. Again, if you factor out the r here, right, you're going to get r times this r to get r squared. So R squares get all canceled out, right? Leaving you with omega squared is equal to omega initial squared plus two alpha delta theta. Right? This is kind of redundant, isn't it? It should be just this. Okay. It should be just, there should be like delta, but you know, it's either one or the other. All right. So as long as you are consistent in using revolutions, you can use that because eventually all the units will cancel out properly. And of course, this is the equation number four if you set them equal to each other, right? So this is equation number four when you set them equal to each other. Okay, so which is basically delta theta is equal to omega final line uh, plus the omega initial, which is the average omega, right, divided by two times delta t. So this is the fourth equation. You use this when you don't know your alpha. All right. All righty. We covered this already, right? We already covered this. So when we talk about the direction of omega and alpha vectors, make sure you use your right-hand rule, not your left hand. It's very important. Right? You have to use your right-hand rule. And make sure you understand which way things are pointing with your thumb. And it should be consistent for everyone, depending on even if you're looking at it from this side or this side, it should be the, it sh there shouldn't be any argument about it. Okay. All right. So, Stanley, aren't you going to ask me something? All right. Let's finish this up. So, here, if we were to just like reiterate what I demonstrated earlier. And for this person looking at this object spinning clockwise, right, here, this is his left hand, right, and this is his right hand, right, right. So this person sees this object, right, clockwise, right? So if this were to be like positive, um, yeah, let's say this is X, and let's say this is Y, and this is positive Z, right? Just to like make it like more mathematics. So here's your XY plane, like this way and positive z is coming out of that plane, and negative z would be going into the plane, right? Using the right-hand rule, right? The right-hand rule for this pink person will be in the negative z direction, right? So, 
Right? So when you use the right hand rule by this pink person, the thumb will point towards the negative Z direction. Right? Well, for this person, right? here's the left hand, here's the right hand. Right? When this person uses right hand rule even though this person sees this thing turning counterclockwise right right but right still negative z hat is what the thumb is pointing to right Right? So they're both in correct direction when you see this. So when this disc is spinning in the XY plane in a clockwise direction for this person and counterclockwise for this person, right? Our omega happens to be right in the negative Z hat direction for the blue person as well as omega is still going to be negative Z hat or even for the pink person. So our omega is negative z hat. Okay. Um, again, if I were to see that omega is negative z, this has to be spinning in this direction, right? Assuming that this is the x, y, this is positive z, right? If alpha is in the negative z direction, it could be spinning faster and faster this clockwise direction, right? Or it could be slowing down going in the counterclockwise direction. So we don't know exactly where, what's the behavior of this just by knowing the direction of alpha. Does that make sense? Two possibilities can happen right, for this negative z hat for alpha. It could be spinning faster and faster and clockwise, uh, clockwise, right? So this could be spinning right? faster and faster. in clockwise direction or it could be slowing down in counterclockwise direction. If it's slowing down in the counterclockwise direction, you're still going to get alpha to be negative z hat. Okay. So if this were to be happening for the single disk motion, let's say this is all happening at for a single disk, then if you still have alpha z, then this is still going faster and faster in clockwise direction, that means this plus this is equal to, right, speeding up right, spinning 
faster and faster. and clockwise direction. Well, for us, from our side, okay? From our view, okay? All right. Let's talk about some other terminologies that we need to understand, okay, so that uh, so there are differences between lowercase t and uppercase t, right? T we know it as time, right? But Uppercase T, capital T, is known as the period of a circular motion or periodic motion, right? Like a swinging pendulum or circular motion, right? And this capital T represents the time to complete one revolution, okay? Frequency is inverse of that. Frequency is represented with lowercase f, right? Because uppercase f is force. Lowercase f is frequency. And it is number of revolutions per second. Number of revolutions per second. So frequency and period are it relate, related inversely to each other, okay? So frequency can be measured as number of revolutions per second. If we have three revolutions per second, it could also be represented as three hertz. So hertz is one over second, okay? So remember some other thing that was the same thing as one over second? Like radians per second can be represented as, right? So this can also be represented as omega, right? So we'll talk about that more in detail, right? And since revolution is 2 pi, right? So we'll talk about that. So if we multiply like omega with 2 pi, I F. This represents angular velocity or angular speed. Okay. All right. So here's some examples. So a frequency of one revolution per second equals period of one second. Right. And frequency of two revolutions per second is equal to period of half a second. So therefore, period is inversely proportional or basically equal to one over frequency or frequency is equal to one over period. So this is important. So since one revolution is equal to two pi radians, two pi radians, right, per revolution, so that is going to be radians per second, and notice how revolutions can cancel out, which gives me two pi radians per second gives me my omega. So omega can be represented as two pi f, or my omega can be represented as 2 pi over the period t. Okay. So sometimes angular velocity omega can be represented as angular frequency.
And sometimes angular frequency or angular velocity can be given to you as radians per second, right? Radians per second. Or sometimes it can be given to you as revolutions per second. Or sometimes it can be given to you as What is that? RPM. Yeah, this means rotations or revolutions, right? Per minute. So when you have something like this, you should either convert it into radians per second or rotations per second or if you keep everything as RPM, then it should be okay if you're using the constant acceleration equation. But be consistent. Be consistent. All right. All right. So that concludes the kinematics of rotation. Okay. Torque, which we will cover next time, because I'm not going to start this today. This is the dynamics of rotation. Because remember when we talked about kinematics, we only talked about like the actual motion itself and how much, you know, how things be moved. We just analyzed the motion behavior of the object's motion. We never talked about what caused that motion, right? Then we talked about dynamics and we said, oh, there's any push or pull that caused that motion, right? And that's the force. And the dynamics is pretty much study of forces. Well, we just talked about kinematics of rotation. Torque is what's causing objects to spin. So you could think of torque as analogous to force in rotation. Okay? Even though the unit may look like joules. It's not. The unit will be, instead of Newton meters, it'll be meter newtons. Just to avoid the confusion. I know. It seems like, what? Isn't that the same thing? Yes and no. Newton meters is actually work or joules, but meter newtons is represented as torque. And you'll see that in like engines and if you if you're like a car freak, like you know, loving those engine specs, torque is measured in meter newtons. All right. Um, I'm gonna stop there for the lecture for today. So what you should do now is if you can print out the uh, homework packets and start working on the homework, okay? Up to all the kinematics part of the homework packet, that will be very nice. So I'll stop the lecture here. Well, maybe I'll show you where that is. So if you can go to the same materials folder that we had. And if you were to open up the homework packet blanks, okay, you should be able to uh, do page three, four, five, Six, seven, page ten is kind of tricky. Right. Right. So you could you should be finishing up to like page ten. We skip like eight and nine, so don't. Oh my God, what was that? There's some pages we skip, so. Now, pages one and two, you should be able to do one. 
two. Um, you could try it, but you don't. You probably won't be able to do it. So do pages one and then three to ten. You should be able to get those out of the way. All right. All right. Any questions? Uh huh. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So get that printed out and start working on it. And we are.